I, yeah, I love, I love doing these just kind of overviews sometimes, and it's sort of looking at these various issues from, <laughs> with the Episcopal or Anglican lens, right? So today I thought we'd just start with kind of what do we believe, sort of the basics, um, sort of what we would call theology, right? The, the fancier word for it, which is just, well, anybody know, what, what does theology mean? What's that word mean? If you break it down, I can't answer. That. Study of God, yeah, right, exactly. Um, but it tends to be coming from like a religious, you know, perspective, a particular perspective. In our case, Episcopal, or the other word for uh, our tradition is Anglican, um, because Anglicanism is is sort of the the overall giant term for all those who came from Church of England and then found their various expressions in different parts of the world because. Anglicanism, and we as Anglicans, we're, we're the third largest Christian body in the world. Um, the Catholics and the Orthodox and the Anglicans, the three big ones. So we span the globe. Um, and I think we do have our, our, our own unique, I think, wonderful things that I, the reason, I mean, and I wasn't raised, I should say, um, Episcopalian at all. And I've, and I've, you know, been involved in a lot of different traditions, but I can definitely, I'll share what draws me as we talk about it um, a little bit. But one of, uh, in, in one of the classes I took, this just stayed with me in seminary. And it was like, our goal as Anglicans or Episcopalians is just this. To believe only those things that all Christians have at all times believed. And it sounds like what? But really what it's trying to do is say, we're not trying to be some little unique little sect over here with all our own special little ideas. Really, our goal in theology is just to uphold that which the church has always upheld and understood to be true, and not to sort of engage. And you'll see this is true in Anglicanism in the Episcopal Church. The goal, at least, I'm not saying we always accomplish it, but the goal is to just hold on to those really big, basic concepts and not to get too caught up and, and in dogma, not to get too caught up in all these little extraneous arguments that the church just does, you know? That's, that's the goal. I'm not saying we always do it, but that, that is, I think, a really, really helpful way to approach faith. So we start with this the basic, very basic concept of, you know, the idea of God, right? We, we presume that God exists. Okay, there's our starting point. God exists. And that God created all that is, right? The cosmos, the universe. But then there's this big question of, like, well, what kind of God is it? What kind of God are we talking about here? Because there's a lot of different ways you could answer that. And the way we've answered that is that God is both imminent and transcendent. Imminent means God is right here with us, very personal, very close, you know, the imminence of God, very close within us even, loving, relational. But God is also transcendent. God is also way beyond, over and above all of creation. Um, incredible, right, sense of power, more than our minds could ever even comprehend is God's transcendence. And so um, it's also independent of us. So we are different from the ideas that we have like in pantheism, where God, God is just everything that is. We'd say, well, no, God is also, God is in everything, but God is also distinct from everything. We sort of hold on to these paradoxes, and this is really true. Um, I think of the early church's concepts of God, but also in, in Anglicanism. So God is all of that, both of the heaven and earth are meeting together in specific times, ways, and places, okay? But it's also different from like deism, which deism teaches, of course, that God is, there's a God that created and then God doesn't care. God is sort of apathetic and doing God's own thing, like, the, you know, the watchmaker who sets the clock and then walks away. We'd say, no, this God is interacting and engaging with us, right? This is the imminence of God very personal, and knows you personally, and yet is so vast and expansive and transcendent and is in everything in our whole universe. I mean, it's kind of mind-blowing, right? And we can't really wrap our minds around it. It's one of the reasons we needed Jesus. <laughs> but we see hints of God everywhere. God self-reveals all over the place, right? Now, what are some, where, when you think of our world, where do you see God revealed? What are some places where you feel like you see God? Nature. Nature. Very good. Yeah, in creation itself, right? The natural revelation, which has been called the book of nature, sort of, um, you know, and, and you can see it in, in how we, we humans act as well, right? 
who see us and God in us as well. Human reason, human longing, longing for God, longing for something more. Um, some would say we, I mean, especially if you look at science, you see, well, you see evidence of God because there's information built into the universe, like DNA, you know? So like, here's the computer code, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> built into everything, right? <laughs> Where else do we see God? We have the natural revelation and also the... Other people. Other people, right? Yes. And then that's a good one. Spiritual? Spiritual or supernatural as well, right? Um, you know, and that is a concept we found in all religions of the world, right? Hints of God's presence and truth in our human experiences. Hi, Mr. Um, and our, our interpretations of that, right? Um, experiencing God in these spiritual ways. Um, you know, it, it, I won't go too much into it, but there's, there's this sense that there's something more than just the material. There's something more than just what we can see and touch. You know, there's those connect points where, we, where our, the feeling of our spirit is connecting with something deeper. So, at the same time, there's sort of like agreement, I'd say, that things aren't quite right. You know, like, yes, we see God and we see God revealed, but it's like something kind of went wrong somewhere. Because <laughs> we're, why? We're experiencing, you know, suffering and pain, and there's evil, there's violence. I mean, even sometimes we look at death itself. There's things that we don't want. It shouldn't, we feel just innately like it shouldn't be. It's unjust. It's not all together. So how do we explain that? And of course, our answer as Christians traditionally has been the fall. We call it the fall, right? This, the story that comes out of Genesis that just, gives us a, a road map of like sin entered the world we have we have free will and we made choices and we don't always choose the right thing you know um, we see this enslaving effect in things like addiction or disease you know um, how would you what word would you use to describe sin it's a big it's an ugly word we put a lot on it but I'm curious what you think of when you think of this kind of brokenness that we call sin is there an image or an idea that comes up for you? Error. Error. Mm-hmm. Good. Bad Error. choices. I, Bad choices. I've always, that's how we raise yeah. our girls, make good choices. Make good choices, <laughs> right. Good. Yeah. Arrogance. Yeah. Arrogance. Arrogance and pride, right? Yeah. yeah. The Hebrew term for it, I love, is so simple. In Hebrew, sin just, it just means this, missing the mark. That's it. You know, it's kind of like you think of a target and a bullseye. You just didn't quite hit it. You know, it's not full of kind of this odorous judgment. You know, it's just, oh, I missed the mark. I'm not quite on the target here. You know, and it's that, and I think it really is that simple. Um, and what we find is that, gosh, we just continue to miss the mark. We as people, don't we? My goodness, watch the news every night, you know, read the, read the news. We just keep missing the mark, and we can all kind of look see oh yeah okay here we go again and so there's sort of this sense and agreement within the church of the solution seems to lie outside of ourselves like as just on our own we just don't seem to quite make it right um we need a higher power um there's a sense of needing purpose because left to our own devices we seem to just keep sinning we seem to just keep missing the mark right despite all our good intentions i think i think the, you know, you think of the, the AA, right, or the 12 steps. A similar idea, right? Acknowledging the need for a higher power, acknowledging that we can't do it on our own, that life is unmanageable. I mean, it's true for all of us, right? We need, and you look at humanity itself. We need, we need God. And as we talked about, and God, fortunately, is experienced in this both transcendent and imminent, close relational way to us. And for us, we see the ultimate revelation of God culminating in a very specific time and place and in a person. What's the answer to that? Who's that? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> the Sunday school answer, right? <laughs> it's true, though. But I mean, it's literally in a Jewish man named Jesus at a specific time. And we often add the word Christ to the end of his name, you know, Jesus Christ. But, you know, that isn't his actual name. Christ means anointed one. It's the Hebrew term. Messiah. But then we have to say, well, who is Jesus? 
Okay, so God is being revealed in Jesus. Um, Jesus, we say, is, is the point in which heaven and earth have met together. Right? In this man, sometimes called the God-man, fully human and fully God at the same time. Here we are, another paradox. Right? The whole incarnation is a paradox. But Jesus is the ultimate revelation of what God is like and what God desires. And he's just here to show us that, point to that. Are there, what are words or, or like images do you, do you have when you think of Jesus? What comes up? Like what's the word that pops up in your mind that describes Jesus? Love. Love. Any others? Son of God. <laughs> Son of God. Good, yeah. Shepherd. Shepherd is the next one. Think of him like, well, now, now is, now is infinite. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So here we have God coming in this person. And, of course, his ministry involves a lot of teaching, a lot of healing. You know, that? Oh, every other story. A lot of truth-telling, sometimes hard truth-telling. A lot of forgiveness, forgiving of sins, and a lot of loving people, loving others, especially who? The outcasts. Those that seem unlovable. What'd you say? The sinners. Yes, yeah, sinners. You know? It's like, nope, you're in you're on the in group, right? And we see him preparing this group of disciples. And then his life culminates in a very important event. Death and resurrection. Right? Um, so this idea that, that we've been failing, we've been missing the mark for a long time, you know, is present. And you see this in all the religions of the ancient world, too. And, and one of the solutions people tried to, to, to get to that was let's put our sin onto an animal, right, and sacrifice, right? We have this, I mean, this is throughout, the, it's a universal concept, this idea of sacrifice. We've got to do something. We've got to make atonement somehow. We have to do something because we obviously keep missing the mark and we keep messing up. And what are we going to do? And there's this idea of, of sacrifice. But in a way, you know, I think that that's the human need that we have to, you know, it's so hard for us to understand God's forgiveness. And Jesus just steps into that role. You need a scapegoat? <laughs> Here I am. And puts an end to it. You don't have to do that anymore, you know. Done with that. Jesus takes on the sin, like God's rescue plan, right? Um, and takes on, and, and, you know, the way we think of it. It's like Jesus is like, take all that sin, take all that, that evil, and let's just put it to death. We're done with it, you know, um, out of sheer love. This is what God is like. I'll take all that. I'll take it from you. I'll die. I'll take it. It's done. You are forgiven. Right? Out of love. And then this wonderful miracle that we're celebrating in this season of Easter is the resurrection from the dead, right? Not necessarily what everybody expected, but necessary as evidence of the conquering of sin and evil and death, right? Because, of course, that's all tied together in the Bible. Evidence that that is done away with. Opening the door then to freedom from our sin. Opening the door to forgiveness, to eternal life, and, of course, our own resurrection. I know this is a big, big view, but I mean, if you just look at it from a big perspective, that's what's going on. Um, and so now the, the possibilities are just infinite, right? Um, we're no longer, we don't have to be enslaved, you know? We can be free, we can be forgiven, we can extend that to others, we can love, we don't have to be constantly caught up in always missing the mark. There's a way out, right, with God's help. So from the Episcopal perspective, Jesus isn't just merely a teacher, though he was a teacher. He's not nearly the giver of a new moral code, um, although he does do that in some ways. And he's not merely establishing a new route to heaven, even though he did create what we call a new covenant or a new agreement. The point is that Jesus comes to bring freedom and a way out of slavery, of sin and evil and the trap of death to establish God's kingdom on earth, right? And what does God's kingdom look like? And what is Jesus inviting us into? What kind of kingdom is this? It's one full of love. What would you say? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Justice. Healing. Beauty. What's that? Peace. Peace, right? This is the establishing of God's kingdom. 
Because we just couldn't quite get there, could we? <laughs> and we're still working it out. It's not like we're there, but but we have we have a path. <laughs> we have a, an opportunity, you know. Um, so we come to know the call that God places on our lives through Jesus. And we read Jesus' words in the Bible. And I'm going to do a whole section talking more about the Episcopal view or the Anglican view of the Bible. But I won't get into that too, too much. But as the word of God, right? But also through this personal relationship, you know. And for us as Episcopalians, one of the big ways we foster that personal relationship with God through Jesus is what? What is one of the things we do in worship that's very important to that connection to God? Communion. Communion. Yeah, the sacraments, right? Baptism, you know. We, our prayers as a community together, coming together as a community, being the body of Christ for each other, right? But sacraments are really primary, right? Holy communion, baptism, we have other sacramental rites, right? It's kind of the the moment we are reminded in these tangible ways of God's presence with us, you know, receiving the bread, receiving the wine, being baptized with the water. Right. Um, so the early Christians were, were in a quandary about how do we describe what's going on here? How do we talk about this? So they had to summarize their experience of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, right, for others so they could share this, this incredible good news. So they developed um, the creeds. And this is sort of the ancient church, you know, the Apostles' Creed was, we know it was already in, in use in Rome by the second century, and it was in its final form by the fifth century. This just goes way back. The Nicene Creed that we say every Sunday. So we say Apostles' Creeds at baptisms. We say the Nicene Creed on Sundays. That was formed by the Council of Nicaea in 325. And that's what really forms our, our baptismal covenant, our covenant with God, right? Those words. And so... The Episcopal Church, Anglicans, have never added to it. You know, if you go to a lot of church websites, you go, well, what do you believe? And they've got their whole, you know, big list of this is, this is our doctrine. And when you go and you read, you know, from the Episcopal perspective, it's like, no, we're still sticking with that main goal. To believe only those things which all Christians at all times have believed. We're not going to add a bunch to it, right? It's just those basic ancient creeds that say it all, right? Um... So what are the important points of the creeds? The Trinity, right? We say God is revealed in Jesus, God the Father, and we experience God through the what? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, Spirit. right? And so Christians are just trying to describe their experience of God. They're like, I know God. I've got that figured out. You know, most of them are Jewish. Some of them are pagan. Got the whole sense of God, God Father, God Creator. But I've experienced God in Jesus. But, of course, at Pentecost, we experience God as spirit also in our lives, living in and through us. So how do we talk about God in that way? And it's very hard, and it's still really hard. I remember in theology class, almost I, I kept asking, well, could you talk about the Trinity this way? And she'd go, no, that's heresy. And I'd be like, well, could you talk Did you say it like this? She'd be like, no, that's heresy too. It's better just not to try. <laughs> you know? Because <clears throat> it's so tricky. But um, we have this sense of God and being experiencing God in these three ways. And they're all fully God, you know, but it's one God. And that gets people, you know, what do you mean it's three gods? And, you, know, it's, you know, it's one God in these three persons. But, yeah. So that's, again, paradox. You see the, the theme here, paradox. God is one, three. Jesus is human and divine. God is imminent and transcendent both at the same time. One better way, I think, to understand Episcopalians is to become familiar with our Book of Common Prayer. Because in it, we, you see that our worship really um, describes our beliefs. We worship how we believe. You know, we don't, again, we don't have the big, the big tome, the big, you know, um, there's a little catechism back there, which is helpful. Um, I've actually invited people to share the catechism on multiple occasions, um, you know, with people who are from other traditions, other Christian faiths. And it's really something because they always say, there's, I can't find anything I really disagree with in it. You know, it's just so basic. It's just so kind of universal in terms of <clears throat> Christian understanding. Um, it, it just kind of expands on what's already in the creed. 
And I love I love that because you know you get you can get everybody you know Pentecostals would be like oh I don't really disagree with anything you said you know or the Catholics well I don't disagree you know they might say well I want to add something but there's nothing in it that's really disagreeable you know um, and so so Episcopalians are constantly trying to meet this like middle way I would call it right where or the via media um, which is which is very very central to our to our understanding. Um, did anybody, uh, you know, think of the Anglican approach? Um, uh, well, okay, who's familiar with the three-legged stool? You've heard of that, right? A lot of us in your confirmation classes get this idea. And I, I didn't bring my, I have a three-legged stool in my office, and I didn't bring it for us. I, I like to, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, sorry. Um, but the three-legged stool is a really good way because Richard Hooker, who's one of our main theologians, we call him in the church early on in England, you know, they're fighting, they're fighting about everything, right, at the Reformation. And how do we understand, how do we understand um, truth? How do we get to a place that this is truth? You know, and it, so you notice that a lot of the argument was about where is authority, right? Is the authority just the Bible itself? So that's Calvin's Calvinism and Presbyterians. And that's why I started railing against Presbyterians because Calvin made me crazy. Um, I, had, I was required to read. I was in a Presbyterian seminary, so I had to read all of Calvin's Institutes. And he's like, "Sola Scriptura. It's only the Bible. Don't look at anything else. Nothing else matters. It's just the Bible. You know, that's the only place that you can get any authority." And it's like, okay, but but wait. I but question, um, don't you have to use your mind to understand the Bible? And who gets to interpret it? Because, you know what, we all have a different interpretation of that same exact verse. How, what do we, you know, how can it only be the Bible? <laughs> you know, and I started having this, this is what part of what spurred me on to look at other traditions. Because I thought, that doesn't make sense. And even when he says, well, it's only the Bible, he still talks about tradition all the time. I started <laughs> noticing that. I was like, well, how did you start talking about the word the Trinity? Because Trinity is not in the Bible. The early Christians came up with that word to describe the three persons, not the Bible. Um, so tradition has to have a place of authority, you know? So an Anglican said, yes, there is the importance of so the three legs. You've got the Bible as one leg. And that might be like the fattest, chunkiest leg. All right? Bible, obviously, center of everything. But where's the other authority? Because now how do you interpret that? What do we what do we make of that? Well, we look at tradition, and that's the second the second step in the stool, right? The leg in the stool. There's the early traditions of the church. Those people closest to Jesus, closest to the early followers, the early apostles. Now they have something to teach us. The early church fathers and mothers, which there were, you know? Tradition's got to have something to say to us. It's got to be authority there. But what's that third leg? And this is, I think, the genius of Anglicanism. What's the third leg? Reason. Reason. Human reason. God imbues us with reason. Um, Methodists later, and now Episcopalians pretty much throw in experience too. Human reason, human experience. All those three have to be in conversation with each other. Those are the points of authority. Because if we take one leg away, you know, it's 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 lopsided. You know, if you so, emphasize tradition too much, yeah. The idea of Episcopal to have an experiential experience of Christ within. Or? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, this idea that we all experience God and we use our minds, our reason to figure out what's happening. I mean, you know, there has to be some authority that God has given us in creating us and understanding and experiencing God. Right? Um, but if you only do that, which some traditions kind of do, it's like it's all about me and my experience with Jesus. I don't need to look at anything else. Well, you can kind of go off the deep end. Right? So these, these legs kind of keep you in this balance, and they have to be in conversation with each other. Doesn't mean you won't still disagree, but we, you know, basically Hooker's like, look, you know, this, he's, when he's developing his ideas, he's like, look, these all are important. You have to have authority in all of these, but you don't want to lean too, too much into one or the other. Um, and tradition, I should say, is a living tradition. Tradition doesn't just stay, you know, stuck in the mud forever. It's it's always being with our mind and reason understood, you know, in new ways, right? Um, and interpretations to it. So we need the whole. In other words, we need the whole church community. We need the whole body, 
including the people who already died, right? They get a vote too, the tradition. <laughs> and we, present day, use our reason and our experiences. We all together work through what the Bible says, and that gives us a sense of what we believe. And so that's what you'll see the Episcopal Church trying to do. I think when you look at convention, like general convention, and we're arguing about things, you see that three-legged stool at work, you know? We're, we're arguing with each other. We're using our reason. We're using our experiences to say, wait, this is, wait, 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 wait. You know, I, let's talk about this issue. Um, you know, Richard Hooker also talks about we're the via media, you know, and it's, it's just a wonderful, for me, I did church history with the Presbyterians first. And then I did church history with the um, Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, and they made a totally different perspective on church history, right? And I'll talk more about that next week. I'm going to do church history, which is a lot of fun. Interesting. But um, you know, you see, you see, um, you know, the Roman Catholics are out there like we're going to burn all the Protestants, and then you see a lot of the Protestants we're going to burn all the Catholics, you know, and there's just like the, all this craziness in in Europe, you know, and some of it happened in England too. But then you have this like voice. From, from some of the top theologians in England, like Richard Hooker and Thomas Cramner, who wrote our prayer book. And it's kind of like they're raising their hand and going, hey, I have an idea. I don't think, they actually said this. So this is like the only people I've read in the Reformation saying this. I don't think that the Catholics are going to hell or that the, the Protestants are going to hell. I think we might all see each other there in heaven. <laughs> we might all, we might like actually all of us have a little bit of something we can learn from the other. I mean, it's like this radical voice of sanity in England coming out of some of these theologians. And nobody else was doing that, you know, in this, in this like, you know, and I think leave it to the English, right, to be kind of like, hey, wait, maybe there's a bit of way, you know, between all this extremism going on. And you have this, this sort of voice in the middle of that in the Reformation saying, I think we could have a middle way via media where maybe the Protestants have something for us, maybe the Catholics have something for us, and what if we put them together and tried to live in that tension? And of course, Queen Elizabeth I is brilliant. She pretty much makes that the formal understanding of church, the via media. She says, we are the middle way. We don't have to choose between one or the other. We can be Catholic and we can be Protestant. Mm, here we are, look at us. You know, and that's what the church becomes. Sort of like, let's take the best of everything. And so we are the Protestant Episcopal Church. We say we're Protestant because our theology is sort of reformed. Um, but look at our worship. Catholics feel very comfortable here. We didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We said, but these beautiful traditions of our liturgy, of our sacraments, we're not letting go of that. You know, this is a way we have continued to experience God. We're going to keep doing it, you know, and we keep doing it. So, um, so we have this very interesting little, I feel like England was like this little sanctuary in the midst of chaos in terms of the theologians' arguments. You have these English theologians just kind of continuing to hold that up. And I feel like eventually a lot of people sort of got on board with this, you know, but, um, that was a really important, and I feel very inspired um, kind of approach during the Reformation. So we try to summarize our beliefs, right? It's, it's other ways to sort of talk about it. We have the 39 articles, it's called, in the prayer book. Um, it's kind of a more sort of like revealing our more Protestant leanings, you know? Um, like it's, this is about a center of relationship and faith in Jesus and in God. Um, we have things like the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral. In, this was written in 1886. And <clears throat> this, this document um, is, is basically the Episcopal Church's attempt to say, hey, if you'd like to be in a relationship with us as ecumenical partners, meaning you all you Presbyterians and all you Lutherans and all you Methodists, and here's kind of the most basic <coughs> understanding of, of how we approach faith, you know? Um, I won't, we don't have time to read them, but, you know, look it up. They're all, these documents are all in your prayer book. You know, they're in the pew. Grab it. Just, there's this, they call it historical document section. Um, we have the Lambeth quadrilateral in there. But what I think is important is that the baptismal covenant, which includes the Nicene Creed, is really primary. And so if you really want to go, what's just like the very basic understanding? Go back to the baptismal covenant, you know, in our baptism service. It has our promises that we make that are fundamental to our understanding. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, about how do we live it out 
as Episcopalians, but um, that that gives us the the the, the guide, right? Um, I mentioned the catechism's great too. It used to be that you had to memorize the the catechism to be confirmed. I always like scaring the youth confirmants with that. Really, like, so you have to memorize it. Um, and I'm like, now nah, I just have to read it. But um, I'm like, okay. Um, in the Episcopal Church, we say everything else <clears throat> outside of that forms the realm of they're like not essential, the unessentials or non-essentials. I don't know what right right word is there, but you know they're not essential to faith. Um, doesn't mean we're not going to argue about it and use our reason and minds and try to you know. But yeah, we do. We we argue about ethics or feminism or sexuality or poverty or abortion, death penalty, social justice, you know, war. Uh, what is the church's relationship with the state? You know, all of this, right? But the key thing is that Anglicans, as Episcopalians, we really take history seriously, we take science seriously, we take human reason seriously, very seriously. So you'll see in our history that we tend to be a little, I mean, we're always behind a little, I'd say, but we are, we tend to be a little quicker than others to move forward on social issues. You know, the Episcopal Church, historically, if you look at us, we sort of tend to always be pushing forward things like, well, divorce, which was a huge point of controversy in the church, right? Accepting people who have been divorced. Or women's ordination, right? We were really at the forefront of that, of that movement to ordain women. Um, we've been at the forefront of dealing with issues of racism, historically. You know, you see this over and over again. Not always, though. There are, there, I'm not saying it's. But I think because of that three-legged stool, because we take these things so seriously, it allows us that, that flexibility to kind of move forward, to grapple with things, and sort of break it open as a church um, and, and live into that tension of human reason and tradition and scripture and work with it. So I mean, that means there's like a wide diversity of beliefs on the topic of, of various topics among Anglicans. And I remember the, the top 10 reasons to be Episcopalian by uh, um, Robin Williams, and you remember that? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so fun, he, he, you know, because he, he was Episcopalian. And he, um, he, wrote, he wrote the top 10 reasons to be Episcopalian, or he, I think he said it in a, in a stand-up or something. But it was like, he's like, well, he, he's like, one Episcopalian somewhere, somewhere in the world, also agrees with you. <laughs> you know, at least one, because we, we are just such a diversity of groups. It's sort of, they call it big tent theology. There's kind of room for everybody. And one of the things that's so unique, and this is, I'm going to say this, really unique about Anglicanism and the Episcopal Church, is that we actually hold the idea that a diversity of opinions is a good thing. We value it. We love that. Like, oh, we disagree. Awesome. You know what I mean? It's one of the few traditions in which we're not trying to get everybody to believe exactly the same thing. We, we, and you know, I think Richard Hooker set us up for it, and then I think Queen Elizabeth rolled with it. This idea of the via media means that, you know what? We want to include everybody in this big tent. We want, we value and cherish that we don't all agree that you can have conservatives and liberals and you can be in tension with each other and not to be laid in stool. You know, we actually value that. And that was something that really drew me to the church, was this idea that um, I didn't have to come with, you know, prescribed sense or I didn't have to change a bunch of things. It was like, here are the basics. You know, here, here they are. Wonderful. Now, how you want to understand that and live that out? Great. Let's talk about it. Let's argue about it. Even. It's okay. We value that we have different opinions, and no two Episcopalians gonna, you know, think exactly the same. And we really like that. That's true. Notice we don't have a pope. You know, uh, we have an Archbishop of Canterbury who is like. It's a very pastoral figurehead. <laughs> they say, you know, he has the power of persuasion, right? Which is like our bishops. Most of the time, bishops, mostly their authority is in the power of their own persuasion. Because we're over here going, well, that's nice, Bishop. Great. I like that idea. I'll take that into you know, consideration. Most of the time, you know? That's <laughs> what so we get to do in the church, right? You don't have a bishop coming in and saying, now, have you done this? And, the, you know, we don't do that. Um, 
we get to express it differently. So different Episcopal churches are going to have a different feel when you go to them, you know. Um, but we're united still in some of the basics of like our liturgy, our worship, you know. Um, the baptismal covenant being the primary, I would say, source of our unity in that way. So, um, we live diversity, we value it, and I don't know any other tradition that so overtly says this is something important to us. You know, I just don't. Anybody know? I, I hadn't experienced it otherwise. So, all right, we have like two minutes. So, any any thoughts, questions? This is like a super quick. I was rushing through too. I'm, usually, I do more, but. You know, speaking yeah. of your wanting to answer, what it, what is it? We are at the Tuesday book study at noon. We are studying the way of the, the Episcopal way, and it's oh. it's been great for me, not knowing a thing. It's been great to figure out. We talk about the three, the stool, the I mean, the, everything that you've mentioned. Mm. It's we've mentioned, so it's we've gone past the basics, and we're in more of the theology part now. Yes. But um, and as a one point that I struggle with being a Presbyterian and Episcopal, you have the Eucharist or Communion every Sunday. And I, a Presbyterians have it once a month, first yeah. Sunday of the month. And, um, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, it, I tr it troubles me a bit because we're about the only faith that concentrates more on the leader's, Jesus's death rather than his word and his way. And most other faiths didn't have to have anybody crucified in order to have a faith that survived and carried on and became... Oh, you mean other religions? And other faith, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. yeah. didn't have to have a cru uh, crucified Christ. And to me, having the Eucharist every Sunday, it's a reminder of the death again every Sunday. And I hmm. thought struggle with that because I feel like I want to I want to talk about his life, his message, what he was all about. But I I'm getting over it because <laughs> I figure I've talked to that book study group, which was a wonderful group, wonderful group of people, and they said, think of it as a community of faith coming together. Thinking uh, think of it as just remembering in remembrance of me. However, that's back to the last supper, which reminds me of the death, which I mean, <laughs> I've, got, I've got to get over that. So I'm trying to find my way. Well, yeah, but I mean, I think the whole point is, it's the focus of it is love. You know what I mean? In my mind, it's, it's resurrection and it's love. But the point of Eucharist is is to remind us of he is you know, with us, always resurrected. With that helps body. too. And that, that why would we talk about it other than it just reveals God's love? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe, I don't know if that, maybe that helps. But, um, and we do it because that is what the early church did. That was the form of worship of the early church. They said, Jesus told us, whenever you gather, do this in remembrance of me. And so that's where we meet Jesus again. Risen Jesus, though, not dead Jesus. Yeah. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't be there. Otherwise, there would be no Christianity if he didn't rise. Yeah, yeah. It's meaningless. Yeah, right. Well, someone asked me at the book site, they said, would you believe, do you think Christianity would have survived if Christ hadn't been crucified? And I, it, I've i never been asked that question oh. before. So I, I went, oh. uh, uh, I, then I said yes, because I think other faiths do survive after the end of the leader however that may come, and they, they grow and prosper. So I don't think we did need that in my mind. Well, um, I grew up Episcopalian in my whole life. This is the first church I came to where they had communion every Sunday. We always had communion just the first week, and then we had morning prayer. So yeah, that was, well, and that, that change came at the 1979 prayer book. Well, I was yeah. before that. Yeah, right. Because, <laughs> and, and, was inter and I'll talk about this in when we do the worship, but we got to go. But what is interesting is that a lot of why we changed things in, in 79 really? the book was because of all the scholarship and archaeology that we did. So we started true. realizing we had a really good understanding of what the early church looked like and what they did. And in that desire to be true to our tradition, we went back to it. It was like they gathered and they had a meal. They had communion. And everyone's invited at that table. And that's the time we commune with each other and with God. That's why I think the word Holy Communion or Eucharist, which means Thanksgiving, it's, it's about 
being together with each, like, with each other and with God and meeting Jesus in that moment again. I wouldn't ever, it's interesting you say because I never think of it as being part of a reminder of his death. I, I feel it's a reminder of, of his presence as a resurrection. And what developing your moment. relationship with him. Yeah. I don't know. So that's interesting. Do you know what I mean? Like the frame that, that we could have, the different frame. But it's okay that you believe that because you're responding now, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Blessings, everybody.